You're watching The Daily Climate Show on Sky News. On today's programme, could hydrogen be a fuel of the future? A new research facility is testing the practicalities. We look at how green the gas really is. The huge damage done to wildlife and ecosystems is revealed as wildfires in Northern Ireland are brought under control. And the 24-year-old Kuwaiti woman giving out plants in exchange for recycling. Hello and welcome to the UK's only daily climate news show where we track the changes happening to our world right now and meet those coming up with the solutions. We aim to take you to the heart of the climate crisis, explain the data driving the changes that are already affecting us, but also show you just how far we've come. And Great Britain has already made significant progress, increasing the amount of electricity produced from renewable sources. And if we look at our data dashboard, you can see today that's at around 39%. But that's just electricity production. 85% of the UK's homes are connected to the gas grid, meaning they use natural gas, a fossil fuel, for things like heating and cooking. Well, hydrogen's often cited as a possible alternative, and now a new research facility is testing how existing infrastructure and houses can be adapted to use it. Well, in a moment, we'll hear from our correspondent, Lisa Holland, who's had exclusive access to the site. But first, how green is hydrogen? Hydrogen. 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 Clean hydrogen. So how would hydrogen work in your home? Well, Sky's climate correspondent Lisa Holland has been finding out. I'm in a remote part of Cumbria at the UK's first hydrogen testing facility. Pipes are being laid, work is being carried out to try to establish how the existing gas network can be repurposed to use hydrogen. Now, at this test site, they've also got a, a set of mocked up houses, a row of houses, the kind of property that you'd find in any town or city across the UK. And the idea with these houses is to try to show how hydrogen could be pumped into a house uh, and the customer would really not even notice the difference in the same way that gas is at the moment. So a hydrogen boiler uh, which would heat the house, a kettle, a toaster and all the things that you might cook all powered using hydrogen. Now currently around 30% of our emissions come from the home so how we heat all our homes and what we do in our homes is crucial if Britain is to get to net zero. More than 80% of homes in the UK currently have a gas supply so there seems to be a high level of confidence that uh, the existing gas network can be repurposed for hydrogen use but there are big question marks about how the development would be funded in the future and how a green clean supply of hydrogen would be developed as well but this is what your home could look like in the future as part of the road to net zero sitting at a dinner table uh, eating food that's cooked using hydrogen and in a house that's warm with the use of hydrogen as well well, joining me now is Sandalay Matetwa, who's a PhD candidate in chemistry at the University of Cambridge. A welcome to you. The site that Lisa Holland was visiting there is testing the use of grey hydrogen, but that's not particularly green to produce, is it? Uh, well, it's not because uh, grey hydrogen is pretty much well known for high carbon emissions, so that really disputes the idea of it being green. Well, yes, and it can be used, hydrogen can be produced using renewable energy, can't it? So is that practical or would you then say, why not just use renewable energy and cut out hydrogen altogether? 
Well, I mean, that's the thing. So green hydrogen uh, would mean, uh, you know, net zero carbon emissions. And at the moment, uh, we are really not at a stage of having green hydrogen. Um, but what's happening more now is, you know, for example, natural gas reforming, where you do produce hydrogen and carbon dioxide, but capturing the carbon dioxide and storing it, so that's carbon capture and storage and utilization could actually be the, the first step into, you know, a more, uh, less carbon intensive um, source of hydrogen. So in terms of green hydrogen, we are not there, but blue hydrogen, which is uh, carbon capture and storage and utilization is probably the best way to go now. And the UK government has made it clear that they feel that hydrogen will play a big part in their ambitions to reach net zero. So how do you envisage the country using and adopting hydrogen over the years to come? To what extent do you think it will be picked up? Um, well, I, I would think maybe um, pretty much a, a big extent, depending on, you know, um, how much, how much uh, research and how much uh, funding is put into the research that goes into green hydrogen. Because at the moment we have electrolysis. Uh, if you are familiar, electrolysis is a process where you are splitting water using electricity and the water is split into its constituent hydrogen and oxygen components. So uh, this, this process, if you are using electricity sourced from say solar power or wind power could potentially be green hydrogen. Electrolysis is, is a, is at a good stage, uh, a more advanced stage really. And I think that if, if a lot of input is put into uh, using, um, you know, solar power or wind power for, for generating ex electric electricity to power electrolysis, that could be the best way. Sandalay Matetwa, thank you. Let's take a look now at some of the day's other climate news. And the majority of people in the UK want the government to introduce green taxes. A survey by Britain Thinks and the Green Alliance found nearly two thirds of Britons support taxing environmentally damaging behaviour. It comes just days after Boris Johnson set out a new emissions target, pledging to reduce the UK's carbon footprint by 78% by 2035. MI6 is monitoring other countries to make sure they're keeping to their climate change commitments. The agency's chief, Richard Moore, said British spies have started to watch large industrialised countries like China to check their progress. He believes the climate crisis should be at the forefront of every country's foreign policy. And more than 60 retailers say they'll halve their carbon emissions by 2030. Boohoo, Primark and ASOS are amongst the fashion brands that have signed up to the Sustainable Action Plan. Each company will look at improving the durability and recyclability of their clothing range. Now, since Friday, areas of the Mourne Mountains in Northern Ireland have suffered huge wildfires with a major incident declared and more than 100 firefighters tackling the flames. The operation's been scaled back today as the blaze was brought under control, but it's thought the fires have had a devastating impact on the wildlife and biodiversity in the area. Well, Dr Neil Reid is a senior lecturer in conservation biology at Queen's University, Belfast. He joins me now. Uh, Dr Reid, just how much damage are are these fires doing to the mountains? I mean, it's an important habitat, isn't it, for, for plants and animals? Well, that's right. The Mourne Mountains are an area of outstanding natural beauty. So first of all, they serve a real function with respect to people going to these landscapes and enjoying these landscapes. Um, but also they're designated for their habitats and their wildlife. They're a, a special area of conservation for their upland um, heathland and peatland habitats. And uh, unfortunately, we're no stranger to these fires nowadays. They are becoming increasingly frequent. We have had a, a string of very dry spring weather from 2010. Um, so we've had multiple years that have been very dry and we've had these fires before. We know that they have devastating effects on wildlife. So at this time of year, we would expect, for example, ground nesting birds to be in the middle of their nesting season, meadow pipits, skylarks, uh, red grouse. Uh, frogs have just spawned earlier and are out and about. Uh, we have lizards coming out of hibernation. We have all of the bees and, and the butterflies and the dragonflies coming out at this time of year, which will have unfortunately been killed over a large area. So this wildfire covered just uh, over two and a half just under three square kilometres. Uh, and it's an area that has been burnt before. So we have these succession of, of events where each time we lose wildlife that we had before that doesn't then subsequently recolonise. And so there's kind of this slow attrition of, of wildlife over time.
What about the broader implications for the environment as well? Because these areas have the ability to store carbon, don't they? So absolutely. <clears throat> Peatlands um, are decomposed plants uh, over tens of thousands of years that have captured carbon dioxide through photosynthesis out of the atmosphere and have locked it away in the soil. Um, so obviously you want these peatlands to function and to continue performing that function of carbon sequestration and storage because it helps the UK and Ireland meet their targets uh, under international agreements to reduce greenhouse gas emissions because we're sucking it out of the atmosphere and locking it into the soils. But what these fires do, of course, is turn Turn the tables, they instantly release um, hundreds, thousands of years of carbon dioxide that have been stored up by combustion. And so we're releasing it so back into the atmosphere. And so it's this positive feedback loop where these wildfires contribute to cl global climate change, which causes then further strange weather to occur for this run of very dry springs. And we expect droughts to continue into the future. They expect to be more frequent, uh, deeper and longer. Dr. Neil Reid, thanks very much indeed. Now for the latest in our series of Climate Diaries, and today we're hearing from Fatima Alzalzela, who's trying to persuade people in Kuwait to embrace recycling. Up to 90% of waste in the country ends up in landfill, something Fatima is determined to change. My name is Fatima Zilzela, the founder of ICASA from Kuwait, where we face many environmental problems related to waste pollution, deforestation, and lack of information. We are collecting recyclables from houses, schools and businesses in order to recycle them. In exchange for a recyclable to get a tree. The inspiration came from um, the TV show Khawata by Mr. Ahmed Shigeri, who had an episode about pollution in general and he was talking about waste pollution and how can we solve it and fight it through recycling as a way to cover this type of crimes. What I wish for is to move toward this solution and to act for nature. That's everything from us for today. On The Daily Climate Show tomorrow, how restoring wetlands can help wildlife and tackle the impacts of climate change. Thanks for watching and we'll see you then.